<clears throat> All right, this morning I'm going to be preaching on the rich young ruler. Uh, this story is in three of the Gospels, but we're just going to look at the passage in Mark 10 mainly. Um, and, the, and the reason why I'm, uh, I just wanted to preach on this this morning is, you know, there's a lot of stories in the Bible that people will use uh, to try and promote work salvation. This is one of them. So I thought it'd be good to be, for you to be familiar with this story uh, as well as others um, so you understand what's, why, why Jesus says the things he does in this story and uh, you know, how, how it's relevant to salvation and to the old covenant and things like that. So we'll look at that story of the rich young ruler in Mark 10. Mark 10 here, we'll just go over quickly <laughs> what happens <clears throat> in the story. Mark 10, 17, And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So this is where some people get mixed up because he does ask the direct question, hey, what do I have to do to be saved? I mean, that's pretty much that question um, in a, phrased in a different way. Uh, we know he's a ruler from a different gospel. It says a certain ruler came to him. So it's funny that we call him the rich young ruler, but he, uh, the, the different aspects come from different gospels. So he says, what shall I do, what, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So first of all, Jesus addresses this, this idea of calling him good master and says, hey, why are you calling me good? And tells him, there's only one good, that is God. Verse 19, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honour thy father and mother. So <clears throat> you can see here that Jesus mentions some of the Ten Commandments um, but you'll notice that he misses one out because one is one that pertains particularly to this gentleman, which is do not covet. But, uh, you know, you could, ask, you could say the thing, well, was Jesus saying something wrong here? Well, he wasn't. And this is why you have to understand that there's an old covenant and a new covenant. Right? The old covenant is the covenant of works. It's not false to say if you keep all the commandments, you'll go to heaven. The problem is, is it's not possible. So Jesus is saying to him, you know, you know the commandments, and he, and he mentions a few. Verse 20, and he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. All these have I observed from my youth. So, uh, you know, we, we know that he's not entirely telling the truth here, but this is his view of himself. And uh, isn't it funny that when you go out and you preach the gospel to people, this is what they think. You know, they think, well, I've never told a lie. You know, I've kept all the commandments. They think they're worthy of going to heaven. So the delusion that people have these days is the same delusion that this rich young ruler had. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Right? So he didn't call him an idiot. He didn't call him, a, you know, you know what you're talking about. You know, just beholding him. He's looking at him. That's what it means to behold somebody. Um, loved him. So you can see the attitude in which Jesus speaks to people that are, you know, have uh, you know, maybe wrong ideas. He said unto him, one thing thou lackest. And I think this is Jesus just being gracious to him because you know, I don't think he's just missing one thing. I think he's just pointing out one thing to him. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great <coughs> possessions. And Jesus <coughs> excuse me, looked round about, saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into, king into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but with God, uh, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So we'll come back to the, to the lesson there, but you can see where it's going. If you just read the whole passage, right? If you just read the whole passage, you can kind of find out the answer for yourself, but we'll go through it a bit more in depth this morning. Now, how do we know he's a young man? Because I was asking myself that question, and I knew it was in one of the stories. I was like, I know he's a rich, rich, he's a rich ruler, because it says that in, I think, uh, in, in Luke. But in Matthew 19, you can see here, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So this is why we know he's called the rich, young ruler. So, 
You can see there how this story is often used to teach of the false doctrine of work salvation. And uh, I think it's, it's good to understand the whole story. And if you read through the whole story like we did in Mark 10, you can see uh, what Jesus' purpose is in how he dealt with that rich young ruler. You, you might say, well, you know, that's a little unfair. Why didn't Jesus just speak plainly? But, you know, that was not Jesus' method in the New Testament. When you see Jesus dealing and teaching things, he often spoke in parables, he often spoke in dark sayings, he didn't necessarily answer things directly. But that's what we see in the New Testament. So we don't necessarily, when Jesus was out publicly teaching and preaching, it was sometimes a bit cryptic. But you can see when he spoke privately, you know, when he spoke with his disciples, when he spoke with Nicodemus, he did speak plainly in those instances. So it was his public teaching that sometimes was a bit cryptic. But then we also have the New Testament, where we have Jesus' disciples then going and teaching and writing epistles, that the teaching is very plain, and we learn more about what Jesus taught his disciples in private. And, uh, you know, we see there Nicodemus in John 3. So what are a couple of things? There's three things that we want to pull from this story of the rich young ruler. Is number one, we see that Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Right? There's a lot of false religions out there that teach that Jesus is not God, He's, Jesus is just, just a man. Some t- religions teach that Jesus is an exalted angel. They say, like, yeah, he's an exalted man, but he's just a man nonetheless. Uh, but that's not the case. All those positions are heresy. Right? With Jesus, you must believe Jesus is God, that Jesus is God in the flesh. And where sometimes people get confused is they'll say, well, is Jesus God or is Jesus the Son of God? Well, he's both. Right? Because when God was manifest in the flesh, that child, that man that was born, was called the Son of God. So we have God manifest in the flesh, is the Son of God, but you also have you know, God in heaven. But it's all the, the one God. Just think about it like this. It's like when you take on a job, right? If you take on a role, then you're, you're not changing who you are, right? You've just taken on a new role. And that's how I like to think of it when God was manifest in the flesh. He took on this role as the Son of God, but he didn't stop being who he was. And we see here when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and mentions to him, he says, and when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running, this is the rich young ruler, kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So before Jesus answers this question, he, uh, he, he responds to this, this, this idea that he's saying to him, hey, you're calling me good. Jesus said unto him, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So what he's saying to the rich young ruler is, do you, do you recognize that you are acknowledging me as God if you call me good master? And that's what we do believe, that Jesus is God. Here's a couple of verses talking about Jesus being God. 1 Timothy 3, 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So you can see here that these are all things that Jesus Christ did, right? Jesus was justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles. Who's preached unto the Gentiles? The Lord Jesus Christ. Believed on in the world. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Received up into glory. Who was received up into glory? You know, the day of Pentecost. Well, you know, Jesus. Oh, no, sorry, not the day of Pentecost. That was later. He was received up as they looked up. You know, they saw him taken with the clouds. Well, who was this man? God. God was manifest in the flesh. So it wasn't just a man. He was God indeed. John 1.1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this is this paradox of the Trinity where you have persons of the Trinity with one another, these identities with one another, but they are one another as well, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The best way I like to think of it is, I think, I think the best way to describe it is three identities that are the one Spirit, because we see the Word, the Father, um, we see the Holy Spirit, obviously, is Spirit. So we have three different roles or identities, but are the one Spirit. And I think the best analogy I've talked about the Trinity in the, before. I think the best analogy to, to understand the Trinity is water, how water can exist in three forms, solid, liquid, gas, but it's all water. And I think that's, how, that's why the, I think the, the, the Bible describes the Spirit as like water, 
you know, we're washed with the Spirit, we're baptized in the Spirit, things like that. So this word, with God, word was God, we see here in verse 14, John 1, 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So why, why is it that when he called him good master, he was acknowledging him as God? Because only God is good, right? So if Jesus was good, then he must be God. Why? Because no man is good. Look at some verses where the Bible clearly says no, no man is good. Every man is a sinner. Jesus was the only sinless one. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. See, this is why we have to go into all the world and preach the gospel. This idea that people will come to you to ask about how to be saved, to ask about God. You know, the Bible says people aren't seeking God, right? God seeks them. This is why people, people are responding to God's drawing. Right? People are responding to God's calling. People are responding to God's people going out and preaching the gospel. Right? This is why we can't have this expectation that believers, unbelievers, will come to us to hear the gospel. We take the gospel to them. They are all gone out of the way. They are, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now, if you didn't know, Romans 3 is actually a quote from Psalms. And it's actually in two Psalms. I think it's Psalms 53 is the other. Psalms 14. So you can see the quote. This is the quote um, from in the New Testament, slightly worded differently. The fool had said in his heart, there is no God. <clears throat> they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They're all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So you see there, no man is good. So <clears throat> this is why, you know, Jesus didn't really leave any middle ground for him to just be a good teacher. Right? Because he, you know how he came to him, good master. And sometimes people think, well, I don't believe Jesus is God. Sometimes people say, I don't believe Jesus is God or the Son of God. But they don't believe he's a liar, right? But they think that he's just a good and moral teacher. But there's no middle ground with Jesus. You can't believe Jesus is a good and moral teacher. Because if he was, what did he teach about himself? What did he claim to be? What would make him good? Because no man is good. So this is why Jesus is saying to the rich young ruler, do you realize that you're acknowledging me as God if you say that I'm, a, I'm good, I'm a good master, right? Because no man is good. Now, have you ever heard the uh, objection to salvation by grace where people will say, you know, they'll give this, uh, this hypothetical that um, doesn't actually exist. They'll say, oh, you know, are you telling me? But so if somebody lives a good life their whole life, but they commit one sin, they don't go to heaven, but somebody who's just a terrible person their whole life and that they believe on Jesus Christ, they go to heaven? Well, yes, that, that's, that's, that's true. But there's a false assumption in that question, right? Because like Jesus said, there's none good but one that is God. So this idea of like, oh, this good person that's just lived this sinless life, you know, I mean, they're describing Jesus, and then, but he commits one sin. Well, this person doesn't exist, right? So people commit you know, droves of sin in their life. I mean, if you just commit one sin every day, I mean, how many sins are that in your life? And, but we commit multiple sins every day. So this idea of like, you know, where they try and have these two extremes, oh, this person is this perfect life. It's always this old granny. Always, always, remember, the old granny used to be a young person before, right? It's like people don't just, all of a sudden, this is an old granny their whole life. They just do nothing but bake cookies and a lot. You know, loving and do all this nice stuff. You know, you know, they were young before and sinful and probably, you know, they probably mature. Hopefully, as you get older, you mature. So, no, no, there isn't this person. But even if they just committed one lie, you know, the Bible says that would still make you deserving of hell. Well, not deserving of heaven, better to put it that way. Revelation 21, 27, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, look at this, or maketh a lie. So how many is that? You don't have to tell multiple lies to not be worthy of heaven. 
Eli, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So you have to make sure you're not blotted out of the book of life. Make sure your, life, your, your name is written in there. And the way you can make sure it stays in there is you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. James 2, verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So you th the thing is, what makes somebody worthy of hell is that they are a transgressor of the law. So that's why any sin will send you to hell. But don't get this idea that all sins are equal, right? Because that's, that's irrational. Not all sins are equal. How do we know all sins are, are, aren't equal? But the reason why people think all sins are equal because they think, well, any sin will send you to hell. Well, that's true, because any sin makes you a transgressor of the law, right? This is what James is saying. If you offend in one point, he's guilty of all. It's not that you've committed every single sin. It's that you have broken the law. You are no longer perfect. That's the problem, right? You have to be perfect to go to heaven. If you sin, you're no longer perfect. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen out of perfection, you're no longer perfect. You're no longer worthy of heaven. But that's not saying that every sin is equal, right? Just because the punishment is hell. There are differing degrees of punishment in hell. Well, I'm not going into that today. But how do we know not all sin is equal? Well, if all sin was equal, then all the crimes in the Old Testament would have the same punishment, right? Why do some crimes have the death penalty? Why do some crimes have a beating? Why do some crimes have financial restitution you know some crimes don't have a some some sins don't have a judicial crime you know like like drugs in the bible doesn't have a judicial crime right like if you grow something in your garden and do something you shouldn't do um that doesn't necessarily have a judicial crime in the bible so my point is not all sins are equal right so that's not what this verse is saying but any sin makes you imperfect and now you're no longer worthy of eternal life. You're no longer worthy. You, 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 you now have to get punished, right? So, <clears throat> that's my first point with the rich young ruler. So, Jesus is God because only God is good. No man is good. Jesus didn't leave that middle ground to just be a good teacher, right? That's, this is one of the greatest arguments for Christianity. Well, one of the good arguments, I think, is like, well, everyone respects Jesus as a good teacher, but that's not actually a position you can hold. Because either he was completely lying, if he was a good teacher, then, you know, can, can you be a good teacher if you're just teaching lies about yourself? Well, no. But if you're teaching that you're the son of God, that you're God in the flesh, you know, that you're the only way to heaven, well, if you're a good teacher, then you have to accept him as God as well, which is what he's saying to the rich young ruler. So, Jesus is God. Number two, the thing I want to talk about is, make sure we understand that being rich is not a sin. The problem with the rich young ruler is not that he was rich, right? And we'll talk about, um, you know, his, his, how it ties into salvation later. But being rich is not the sin. There's nothing wrong with having wealth. There's many wealthy people in the Bible. Abraham was wealthy. Joseph was wealthy. I mean, Joseph was running Egypt, right? Joseph was wealthy. Job had a lot of wealth before he lost it all. But remember, you read all the book of Job, he got it back at the end, right? So he got it back at the end. He had more children. So... Plenty of people that had plenty of wealth. David was a king. You know, Daniel would have been very well off as well, being one of the nobles, one of the wise men in, in Babylon. So uh, a lot of people, had, a lot of righteous people in the Bible had a lot of wealth. So it's not, not that, you know, we're not talking about the prosperity gospel saying hey, if you're a Christian, you will necessarily be wealthy. But we don't want to go the other way too because it's not necessarily a wrong thing to have wealth, right? What is the problem with wealth? What's this, this idea that if your purpose in life is just to build wealth. That is the problem. And, and unfortunately, too many people do live just for wealth. You say, well, I'm not living necessarily gold and silver, but how many people just live their life, just want to have a house? You don't want to be out on holiday. You don't want to just be able to retire and live my life. Just this, this idea that you're just living for pleasure and living for the things of this world rather than the things of eternity. 1 Timothy 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I'll just stop here because, you know, this verse, and, and, and the reason why I think it's important as Christians to have this balance, because it's not, it's, it's not right at the two extremes. You know, it's not right 
to say, you know, you just live, you know, Joel Osteen, you know, best life now, you, you have to be healthy whether you're not, there's something wrong with your faith. But it's also not right the other way too, to say like, oh, you know, if you're really righteous, maybe you have nothing, you know, and just sell everything and all that, and just live on the street, because ultimately when people live that way, they end up living off the hard work of others. <laughs> You've seen that. When people, they, they, they believe, they're, tr they're trying to live like this righteous life where they don't have any possessions and everything like that, but they end up having to live off other people's hard work. Right? So we don't want that either. So the reason why I'm stopping at this verse is because I've often heard this verse used to stop people from being ambitious. Right? What does it mean by ambitious? Like trying to excel in life. You know, there's nothing wrong with trying to excel, get a better job, get a higher income. The problem is, what do you do with that? You know, what's the, why are you doing that? This is the question that must be asked. So this verse is not teaching that, you know, there's nothing, that, that you ought not to be, to strive for excellence. You ought not to strive to be ambitious, strive to, you know, be a better employee, be a better boss, have a more successful business, those sort of things. Because hard work is good. What content is saying, what, what is contentment? Contentment doesn't mean that you're just, you know, um, What's the word? Can I complacent? That's what sometimes people think contentment is. Like, I don't want any more. No, contentment means that you're happy. Right? So you can, you can be happy whether or not you achieve that or not. And, and the great test to see, hey, godliness with contentment is great gain. The, the great test is when you don't achieve those goals. You know, let's say you strive for something and you don't get it. Are you still happy? Like sometimes people, they strive for something, they don't get it, maybe it's that job, or they want to start that business, or they do that thing, that thing, and then their life just comes crumbling down, you know, they get depressed, and, you know, well, you know, are you content with such things as you, as you have? You know, what about if you lose that thing you work so hard for? You know, that's the great test of godliness with contentment is great gain. It's not saying that you shouldn't have any ambitions in life. For we brought nothing into this world, it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Right? So the Bible's telling us here, well, if we have food and clothing, we should be happy. Right? But it doesn't mean that we can't be ambitious, can't strive for more things. Right? First Timothy 6, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So it's not people that are rich, right? Or people that work hard and have wealth. It's that they will be rich. It's that the purpose that they're doing these things is to be rich. That's the, the difference, right? For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So you can see here that money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. So that ties in with those that will be rich. Will is not just a future tense like we use it. Will means they want to be rich. They that will, they want to be rich, fall into temptation and snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts. So it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. It's not money that's the root of all evil. Right? Money is just a tool that can be used for good and bad. Now notice it's the, it's the root of all evil. I'll just explain this because some people haven't heard my explanation on this. Some people think, well, how is the love of money tied to all evil, right? So it's not saying here that the love of money is the seed of all evil, the start of all evil, because some people teach this verse and say, well, love of money is tied, it's the reason for every sin, which I don't believe is what this verse is saying, right? It's not even saying the love of money is the root of all sin, because not all sin is necessarily evil, right? Like evil is when you do harm to another person. So what... This is actually saying, when it says the love of money is the root of all evil, it's saying the love of money is tied into harm to others. And we can see that in the world, right? We can see the medical industry is a perfect example, right? Where the love of money can lead to a lot of harm, you know, in our country as well. Not only is there many vaccines that are dodgy histories, but then you also have, like, the withholding of, of uh, a lot of medical treatments and things like that that have caused, to a, lot, caused a lot of hurt. Right? And it's the love of money where the you know, bureaucrats and medical industry hold, withholds all these things from people. So you can see there that the love of money is the root. What is the root? So it's different to the seed. The, the, way I, what, the way I like to understand it is, well, if you think about the root of a tree, the, the roots is not how the tree started, right? The tree would have started from a seed. 
But the roots is what gives the tree strength. The roots is what, like, the tr how the tree gets sustenance from the ground, soaks up the nutrients, the water, and things like that. So the way I like to think of this is the love of money is really what strengthens and gives stability to evil in this world, right? And that's how I think that that should be. And that's why, you know, love of money is a really terrible thing because it perpetuates <coughs> a lot of evil. <coughs> they have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. See, beware. You know, they talk about what? Is it sex, money, power? You know, beware of these things, right? Don't do these just for these sake, right? Because if you just follow riches just for the sake of riches, you're going to be like the, the rich fool, right? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Jesus says here in Matthew 6, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So how do, you, how do you practically do this? The way you practically do that, I think I mentioned it in the previous sermon, how do you lay up treasure in heaven? Well, it's when you use your resources to do things for eternity, right? Think about it. Your, your resources are either measured in time or in material possessions. You say your material possessions is just a physical manifestation of the time that you've put into making those material possessions. So when people say you give of your wealth, it's no different to giving of your time, right? Because time requires time to make money, right? So how do you lay up treasures in heaven? It's when you use your money, you use your time to do things for the kingdom of God. Things that help teach the Bible, teach the gospel, get people saved, help people to do those things as well. That's how you lay up treasure in heaven. You don't want your purpose to just be wealth. Proverbs 23, 4, Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. It was funny where uh, my wife, I'll just share what my wife was saying yesterday. She was laughing that, you know, where it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. And she was thinking about the, uh, you know, the pharaohs, you know, the pharaohs where they, they believe that they get buried with all their riches. You know, they believe it's going to go into the next world with them. Now, what's happening now? Now people are basically grave robbing, <laughs> you know, getting in there, you know, taking all their stuff and putting it to museums or whatever. I mean, that's, that's a good example of, you know, what Jesus is saying, hey, where thieves break through and steal. You know, they come, people grave rob you. Take all your stuff that you put in your grave. Here's the parable of the rich fool. He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself. And I just, just on that thought there is, you know, it's funny that, you know, the Bible talks about it's God that gives us the power to get wealth. And sometimes people, they, they think that their wealth is a measure of how great they are, and they forget that God has helped them to get that wealth. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So you can see the, the hoarding of his goods for himself to have this good life, rather than, Hey, well, maybe my barns are full. Maybe I can use this wealth to help others. And I will say to my soul, soul, as much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So what is God saying here? God is saying, hey, if you just try and live for yourself, and you just lay up treasures just to be rich and just have a comfortable life here, he's calling you a fool, right? Because this is the rich fool here, and he's saying, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of him. But he's saying, hey, that sounds like me, this rich fool. Well, verse 21 says, so is he. Right? What is that? The fool that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's not be fools. 
Right? Let's not just use our life to lay up treasure upon earth. Let's use our life to lay up treasure in heaven where moth dust doesn't corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. So there is a danger to chasing riches. Right? To get caught up in this world, caught up in the materialism of this world. That, you know, that becomes, the means becomes an end. Right? You don't want that to happen. But on the same token, it's not wrong necessarily to have wealth. What do you do with that wealth? So we read in 1 Timothy 6, but look at further down the chapter, verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded. What does that mean? That they think too much of themselves, too lofty and proud nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You can see that this link here as we go back to the rich young ruler later, trusting in uncertain riches, that they do good. See, if you have a lot of wealth, right, if you have a lot of resources, it enables you to help a lot of people to do good things with that. So this is what God is charging to those that have riches in this world. Hey, use those riches not just to buy yourself more things and to enjoy, you know, be like the rich fool, take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You know, now you've got more money, you got more expensive, more expensive holidays, more expensive gadgets, just spending it all on yourself. No, that they, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Okay, so being rich is not a sin in and of itself, but there are things that we, the love of money we have to be aware of. But if we are rich, we use those riches to help, right? Why do we want these, why do we want to help these things? You know, a lot of people, you know, when they think of, uh, you know, rich people in this world, they just think, oh, you know, well, because nowadays a lot of people get rich, maybe because of inheritance, maybe of corruption, you know, doing dodgy deals with uh, politicians and bureaucrats and whatnot. But for the most part, a lot of people get their wealth through hard work, you know. And, you know, in a, in a free market, not in like a communist socialist market, in a free market, I mean, people build wealth and businesses are successful because they bring value to people's lives. Right? So being a businessman and bringing yourself wealth, it, were it not for corruption in the, in the government, I mean, they're, they're quite noble people, right? Because in order for people to be willing to buy something from you, they have to be, think that it's worth the money that they're paying. Right? So in a free market, you know, businessmen actually bring value to people's lives. And if you make money from bringing value to people's lives, that's a good thing. Right? And then you can bring even more value to people's lives by then using that money for you know, eternal purposes. All right, so let's get back to this rich our rulers. We talked about Jesus is God. Number two is being rich is not necessarily a sin. So let's go back to this story now. So what was the purpose of this story? This rich young ruler, this, this, the way Jesus responded. Well, the purpose that Jesus responded this way is because he was exposing the belief of work salvation in this person. Right, because this person came to Jesus, he asked him, hey, what... What, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus knew that he was trusting his works. So he talked about, hey, well, keep the commandments. He listed off a few, but he left out, thou shalt not covet. All right, and then what was his response? <laughs> All these things have I done from my youth. So you can see here that his response exposed the fact that he's trusting in his work salvation, in his own works. And this is why Jesus mentioned to him, well, one thing you lack. And he's trying to say, hey, well, here's something you haven't done, right? Go sell all you have and give to the poor, you know, thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And then he went away um, sad. Right? He went away sad. So, in this story, was Jesus teaching work salvation? Well, in one sense, he was alluding to the old covenant, but he wasn't teaching work salvation because it's possible. He was telling him about work salvation because it wasn't possible. And when we see how he then turned to his disciples and explained things, you can see this is what he was getting at. So publicly, he was talking a bit cryptically, a bit dark, but what he was trying to do is he was trying to point people to the fact that they, they were trusting in their works and this was not possible, trying to get them to think differently. Mark 10 verse 20, Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, how hardly shall they have riches 
enter into the kingdom of God. So you say, well, is there a problem with being rich? No. You might say, well, rich people, they tend to, you know, not you know, trust in themselves, right? And they tend not to, to not want God. Well, that, that's, that's definitely a truth there. But is that what he's saying here? He's just saying, well, if you're rich, it's hard for you to, to, to believe on Jesus Christ. Well, that's not necessarily what he's talking about in this context, even though that is what we tend to see in the world. We do tend to see people that are more well-off tend to feel like they're a bit more self-sufficient and they don't have that humility to need God, right? In terms of believing on him for salvation. But what is this saying here? Well, he's saying, hey, if they have riches, verse 24, the disciples were astonished at his words. So now Jesus clarified. Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? So you, you think about this and you say, well, they're trusting in riches. And you think, well, nobody's really like putting their faith in gold or silver to get them to heaven. So, so how does that tie together? The way I like to think of it is, well, like I told you before, your wealth is like a measure of your work, isn't it? It's your time that you put in to build that work. So when I believe what he's saying here is when they're trusting in their riches, because if you think about it, a successful person is very self-sufficient, does a lot of work themselves, and they're probably thinking, well, this person does so much work, and they're not getting into heaven, you know, well, how is anyone going to get into heaven? So this is why he clarifies, it's not just the fact that they have riches, it's that they're trusting in their riches, and I think that's alluding to the fact that they're trusting in their own good work, just like their own business. They, they work so hard, but that's not going to get them into heaven. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? So you can see here now Jesus is now alluding to salvation by grace. Right, so this is not about salvation by works. It's not saying, hey, oh, did you really think he's saying to this rich young ruler, well, if you did do this thing, then you would have earned your way into heaven? No, of course not, right? So he, he's saying these things to, to reveal to him, you have not kept the commandments, even though you claim to. Right? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So this is not talking about the difficulty for a rich man to believe on Jesus Christ. This is saying no matter how much works you have, no matter how successful you are in life, you're not getting into heaven, right? Because how can, can a camel go through the eye of a needle? No, it's impossible. So Jesus is saying here, he's not saying that, oh, you know, I guess you could just like you know, kill the camel and then just like string him through this eye of the needle, you know, uh, you know as a liquid. But no, what he's saying here, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of He's making the point, look, it's impossible even for a rich man to work his way to heaven because working your way to heaven is impossible. And they were astonished out of measure saying among themselves, so you can see here the, the amount of uh, like respect they have to people that are rich in this world. Right? They're saying, well, all these people are rich and they're so capable. Right? Who then can be saved? Do you see there that they're still thinking work salvation? Well, man, if a rich man can't get themselves into heaven, how can us? You know, we're poor. We have nothing. Jesus looking upon them saying, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Right? So you see there that what is this story of the rich young ruler? Is Jesus teaching them, oh, you know, work your way to heaven. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, you just make sure you keep the commandments. You're just you're missing a few. Just do them. No. He's pointing out that no, you haven't kept the commandments. Right? In fact, it's impossible. Even a rich man can't get himself to heaven. But with God, all things are possible. Why? Because if we believe on Jesus, that's how we get to heaven. Right? So this is what this, how this story should be understood. Now, this is the danger of building doctrine of stories. Right? Because stories need to be understood with doctrine. You can't understand this story correctly if you don't understand salvation. You can't have it the other way around. You can't then misinterpret all the salvation verses because you have a story that you've misunderstood. But you can see how people use this for work salvation. I want to compare this with Luke 10. <clears throat> this is the second last passage I'm going through. Luke 10. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. We see here a very similar example with the rich young ruler. I want to show you that Jesus deals with it the same way. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this is not the rich young ruler. This is now somebody else 
right? A lawyer asking Jesus, hey, what do I do to go to heaven? But he's looking for like, what works do I need to do to go to heaven? He said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? Saying, you're a lawyer. He's like, what do you read? How do you understand it? He answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. So this is different. Now he's not listening out the Ten Commandments. Now he's giving the two great commandments. To love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor himself. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So is Jesus making a wrong statement there? No. Because if you, you know, because you can hang all the law of the prophets on these two commandments, if you kept them, you would go to heaven. Right? But the problem is you don't. So he's trying to reveal to him. You haven't done these things. Hey, if you do this, thou shalt live. Look at this, verse 29. But he, so he knows that he's not keeping these, right? But he, look, willing to justify himself. So you're not justified by faith, not justified by the sacrifice, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's trying to justify himself that I've kept these commandments. Said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So you see the response from the rich young ruler, right? The response from the lawyer showing you that they're trusting in their work. So this is what Jesus is pulling out. This is what he's trying to reveal to them. Jesus answering said, so now he's saying, well, he's trying to say he's kept it, but who is my neighbor? You know, maybe I've kept it, but we, what's the definition of neighbor? And then this goes into the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So the idea of this parable is that these supposedly religious, holy people don't even want to have a bar of just helping someone. They don't have any love. So what's the difference? A priest is descendant of Aaron. Do you remember Aaron and Moses? Brothers? I believe Aaron was the older one. Oh, Aaron? So the priests were descendants of Aaron. They had special responsibilities in the tabernacle. <coughs> he comes down, <coughs> saw him, he passed by on the other side. So that's sometimes, you know, when you're walking down the valley, they see something, and then they go across the street, <laughs> they go down the other side. That's what he's doing. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So the Levites are saying, now what's a Levite? Levite is a descendant of the tribe of Levi. Right? So the Levites had three different families, and they had different responsibilities in the tabernacle. But they weren't the priests. So, for example, one of the families in the family of Levi had the responsibility of packing down the tabernacle, putting it back up again. They all had different responsibilities. So you say, what's the difference between a priest and a Levite? Priest is a descendant of Aaron. Aaron was a Levite, though. Aaron was in the tribe of Levi. Same with Moses. Right? So they were Levites, but specifically the descendants of Aaron were the priests. And a Levite is just anyone that was of that tribe. They weren't necessarily priests. They did the same. Right? A certain Samaritan. Why, why did the Jews not like the Samaritan? Because the Jews, the, the, the Israelites intermingled with the Gentiles, right? And that's why they didn't like the Samaritans. It's a bit of a racial thing there. So that's why they didn't like the Samaritans. But that's why he's making this point. That this person, even though he was a Samaritan, the ones that the Jews didn't like had more love than the Levites and the priests as he journeyed came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence. Now when you think two pence, that's just not talking about two cents. Like pence here. A pence <coughs> is a day's wages in the Bible. So, you know, it's like when, when, uh, when the parable of, like, you know, the people at the 11th hour, he, he gave them a penny for the day's work. And even the ones at the 11th hour, he gave them a penny as well. And they, they got upset. So this is a man spending two days worth of wages to take care of this person. Gave them to the host. And look at this, and said to him, take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. So you see there that, He's saying to this lawyer, which was likely a Jew, right? He didn't like the Samaritans, but he's saying, hey, this Samaritan was being a neighbor. Be like the Samaritan. Probably somebody that he despised in his heart. 
So, likewise with the rich young ruler. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, you can see it, Jesus is not saying, well, be the Good Samaritan in order to go to heaven. Yes, he is teaching us some good things to do. But what was it in response to? In response to him thinking he could justify himself by thinking he had loved his neighbor as himself and loved God with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. And he's showing to the lawyer, no, you haven't. Because this is what that would mean. And in his instance, he hasn't done it. Right? So now when you read Mark 10, 26, now it all makes sense. They were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Jesus looking upon them saying, with men it is impossible. Right, so what is this verse talking about? This is talking about salvation. You know, even though we use this verse to apply to other things, hey, with God all things are possible. I believe that. But what is it specifically talking about? Salvation. It is impossible for a man to save himself. But with God all things are possible. Why? Because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So hopefully you learn not just about, you know, the rich young ruler today, but about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Understand these stories, you know, understand these parables, how they should be understood in the light of salvation by grace. You know, and that way you don't get mixed up, you, know, you don't get accidentally you know, dragged back into under bondage, believing in work salvation. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Um, I thank you, Lord, that, you know, we have a whole Bible that we can read, we can study, we can compare scripture with scripture, get a good understanding of, you know, why you said some of these dark, some of these cryptic sayings in the Gospels. So, uh, Lord, we uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've revealed the truth unto us through your word. And we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.